Welcome. I'm sure you've seen at one time or another someone on YouTube claiming that the sun either causes or influences things like earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. These ideas have persisted for a number of years, yet with there's very little scientific evidence to support them. So I thought it would be time to take a look at this once and for all and decide what the facts of the case are and whether we can actually use the sun as an earthquake or volcanic eruption predictor. Perhaps first we should take a look at to see what causes seismic events in general. There are two basic types which we're most familiar with and that is volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. They're both basically the result of the motion of tectonic plates. Earthquakes are caused by a fault slippage. So on the boundaries between these plates, as the plates are moving, the rocks there can catch uh, and effectively cause friction. When the pressure of the motion of the plate overcomes that friction, suddenly the plate moves and it causes what we know as an earthquake. This slippage can take the form of a vertical slump. That's often what results in a tsunami, for example, or it can take uh, the form of a translational motion along the fault, as is what is happening in California and the San Andreas Fault. Volcanic eruptions, on the other hand, are caused by the buildup of magma, which is basically molten rock, near the Earth's surface. The cause of this formation of this molten rock is the subduction of one plate underneath another, like is what is happening in Japan and Mount Fuji. The molten rock can seep towards the surface through cracks in the rocks and form a volcano, and that effectively holds in the pressure of this upwelling rock. However, eventually the pressure builds up to the point that the um, magma can force its way to the surface in what we call a volcanic eruption. Now the question before us is, how can the sun possibly influence any of these processes? And frankly, it's difficult to see how it can. There seems to be two schools of thoughts amongst those that push the idea that the sun is influencing the Earth's seismic activity. One, the very high levels of solar activity, such as large numbers of sunspots, flares and coronal mass ejections can cause seismic events. The other school seems to think that low levels of solar activity can cause these sorts of occurrences to happen. I do wish they'd make up their minds. But let's take a look at the ways in which the sun could influence the earth and see whether any of them hold water. The obvious one is gravity and we see its effect to every day in the form of tides. In fact, we see it twice a day. Electromagnetic energy uh, comes from the sun in abundance. In fact, we get 99.9% .9 of the energy input to the earth directly from the sun in this form. And one particular thing that people like to focus on are flares and coronal mass ejections. Another thing that the sun puts out in large quantities and over a large volume of space are magnetic fields. And the earth passes through these magnetic fields as it goes around on its orbit. The earth itself has a magnetic field and that this, these fields can interact with one another. But is there enough energy in that interaction to create the uh, sorts of uh, forces that would initiate and cause uh, seismic events? Lastly, there are charged particles. Our primary source of charged particles is the solar wind. These can cause geomagnetic storms if it blows strong enough and dense enough. Could the geomagnetic storms induce effects in the lithosphere of the Earth that would enhance the possibility of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions? The other possibility is cosmic rays, and we should take a look at that as well. First, let's take a look at tidal effects. This is the one we're most familiar with because we see the effect of tides every day. But there's some things we should remember about tides. First of all, it's a combination of the moon and sun's effect and the moon's tidal effect is 30 times stronger than that of the sun. The sun's gravitational pull does vary but it's only by 7% throughout a year and that's due to the change in distance of the earth to the sun due to the eccentricity of the earth's orbit. 
The moon's gravitational pull on the Earth can vary by 30% in a month, again due to the eccentricity of the moon's orbit. So we have a situation here where the moon is 30 times more uh, effective. The variation in its gravitational pull it varies four times more than it does for the sun. And its cycle is uh, 12 times faster or 13 times faster than that of the variation in the sun's gravitational pull. So all in all, we should see a very strong lunar signal in the seismic events through around the globe. Uh, and the thing is, we don't. And so that doesn't leave very much room for any effect gravitationally from the sun. Let's take a look at an example of one of these predictive methods. And the, one of the most well-known one is that of Birkeland. He uses tides, magnetic fields, and animal behavior to predict upcoming earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. He produces plots like this, where he takes the tides and magnetic fields into account, producing what he calls a seismic window. Now, if an earthquake or volcanic eruption happens within that window, he claims a successful prediction. He claims using this method, he predicted the Loma Prieta and Northridge earthquakes. Now, I was actually in California for the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and it was quite some experience and I remember at the time him talking about this on the radio that he'd predicted this successfully yet he also said that there'd be a larger quake in a month's time which of course didn't happen so from personal experience I have a great deal of skepticism about these sorts of predictions and one reason for that is that the failure rate is not generally discussed and what a lot of these people do, like suspicious observers, is to set the seismic window so long as it's longer than the average time between such events. And so you're almost certain to get some events during your window and you play those up as successful predictions and forget about all the rest. The only successful prediction of earthquake was by Richter himself. I think in parodying such predictions as we've seen here, Richter says quakes always occur within three months of the solstice, which if you think about it is a very accurate prediction, but completely useless. The Earth receives over 99.9% .9 of its energy in the form of light from the sun. And most of that is in the visible part of the spectrum, i.e. the part of the spectrum that we can see. There is a second window at long wavelength radio, but the, it's energetically insignificant, so really can't be a, um, a player here. The problem with using electromagnetic energy in the form of light is that it varies very slowly. The total solar radiance varies by only 0.1% over a solar cycle, and on average about 11 years. So you have a very small variation over a very long period, which is unlikely to lead to catastrophic events like an earthquake or a volcanic eruption. We do have a larger variation in insulation from the change in the distance between the Earth and the Sun due to the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. But even so, that's only 7% over a year. And then you can look at latitude variations, and there are some of those are extreme. Near the equator, there's hardly any variation in insulation at all. Yet at the poles, there's 100% variation. So you'd imagine on, based on that, that most of the volcanoes would be concentrated near the polar regions, and they aren't. When you look at the locations of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, they flow along the boundaries to the tectonic plates. So it seems to apply that seismic events are caused by motions of the plates with respect to one another rather than the sun. Now I've just seen that we can't produce a seismic event as a result of a long-term slow change in the total solar energy input to the Earth. But what if we had an impulsive event? Could that produce the effect that we're looking for? Now, the most impulsive and strongest events we know are called flares. So let's take a look at the energetics of flares and see whether they can give us a big enough impulse to possibly uh, cause an earthquake or a volcanic eruption. The biggest flares that we see uh, are about six times 10 to the 25 joules. That's an awful lot of energy. However, that energy is spread over a very large volume of space, given that the Earth is 150 million kilometers away from the Sun. 
So the energy input to the Earth is actually quite small, and you can see that here on the right in the top frame. The red curve is the light curve of an X flare. Uh, the black curve behind it is the equivalent plot from uh, total solar radiance. And I must admit, I cannot really see any evidence of uh, any signal from that total from that flare in that total solar radiance. Now, somebody took this further and took 130 of our largest flares, varying from M5 to X10, and found the time to superimpose all of those peaks on one, one upon another, and then looked up the equivalent solar, total solar radiance measurements and superimposed them. The resulting curve is the one below here. And you can see just barely above detectability 2 sigma, there is a peak at zero, which is what you'd expect. But this would be equivalent to an increase of 0.002% in the total solar irradiance, which is hardly very much. And remember, this effect only lasts for a few minutes. The other problem here is that there's no physical mechanism to link an increase in electromagnetic energy input to the Earth to the initiation of a, a seismic event. So we have two problems. Even these impulsive events don't put enough energy into the system to make a difference, and we don't have a physical mechanism that would link the two anyway. So this seems to be like a non-starter. Another idea that is often touted is that the sun's magnetic fields can jostle the Earth's magnetic field, which feeds back into the lithosphere, causing seismic events. There are many problems with this particular idea. The sun does have some very strong fields, particularly in sunspots. They're over 20,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. However, they're a long, long way away, 150 million kilometers. And by the time they reach the Earth, those magnetic fields have reduced to something like six nano Tesla. That makes it 10,000 times weaker than the Earth's magnetic field. It's rather like running into a brick wall Another idea that's often pushed is the idea that the solar wind could be causing some of these sorts of events. After all, it's a, a stream of hot plasma passing the Earth every second. So let's take a look at the energetics to see whether there's enough energy there to make a difference. Assuming that all the solar wind's energy is transferred to the Earth, the amount of energy going into the Earth would be the density times the volume, that's the number of particles, times the kinetic energy of the particle times the area of the Earth, the projected area of the Earth. And that would break down to the density times the velocity times time, which we're going to set to be 1, a half mv squared, which is kinetic energy, and uh, times 2 pi r squared, where r is the radius of the Earth. Now we know that the density is about 5 particles per cubic centimeter. The velocity is about 400 kilometers per second. The time will set at one second, so this becomes a rate. And the mass of a hydrogen atom, which makes up most of the solar wind, is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And the radius of the Earth is 6,357 kilometers. Now you have to do a lot of sorting out about the relative uh, units used here, and then plug it into that particular equation, and you get that the total energy is 345 joules per second. A joules per second is a watt. So that says that if you stood a few thousand kilometers above the surface of the Earth and shined a 350 uh, watt lamp bulb at the Earth, that's the amount of energy that would be input by the solar wind, assuming it, all of that energy went in. And we know, of course, it doesn't because most of the solar wind is diverted around the Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. So this is going to make absolutely no difference at all. If it did, then every single streetlight would be a source of volcanic eruptions or earthquakes, which of course is not the case. You can do a similar sort of calculation with cosmic rays, the source of other charged particles coming into the Earth's atmosphere. Now these have a huge amount more energy than the solar wind does per particle, but there are many times fewer particles. This is the spectrum of cosmic rays that you would see. All you need to know here with energy at the bottom is that 1 eV is equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the 19 joules. Now, if you go to that plot, part of the plot down here, you can see you're going to get about one particle per square kilometer every 10,000 years. So not exactly a high rate. 
And you can play around by choosing different values here and plugging them into various equations uh, and seeing how many watts of energy that they produce. And the cosmic rays end up producing, so this is a tiny fraction of even the small amount of energy coming in from the solar wind. So these two can be discounted as a source of uh, sudden energy input to cause uh, a seismic event. Let's stop all this fuffing around with theory and actually have a go at looking at some data. I've taken 2000 eruptions and seen how many occur in each of the years over the last 25 years. And you can see that there doesn't seem to be any particular pattern here. And I would further argue that there's in fact no difference in these points uh, across the board because this arrow shows the uncertainty on any one of those values. And effectively that says statistically all these points have exactly the same value. But let's for fun just mark on here when solar minimum and solar maximum are occurring and see if there's any particular pattern. Now, there are two schools of thought as far as using solar activity as an indicator of seismic activity. One says most of it occurs during solar minimum. The other one says it occurs during solar maximum. Often this argument will be used by the same person depending on what time of the solar cycle it is and they just hope you don't remember what they were saying five years before. Mark solar minima in green. The first one here occurs at a minimum in the number of uh, seismic events uh, in that particular year. The next one occurs at the maximum and the third one occurs somewhere between the two. So I'd argue there's no particular pattern there. So let's try solar maximum instead which I've marked in red and both of them are somewhere between the two. So there's no real pattern at all here uh, to uh, give any credence to the fact that solar activity is producing uh, seismic events. So there's no correlation and the points are statistically meaningless anyway. Ah, but you say, I think it's fairly plain to say there's no known mechanism that has enough energy or the right time scale to connect solar activity to volcanic eruptions or earthquakes. In fact, there's no physical mechanism to do that either. When you look at the data over the last 25 years, there's no correlation with solar activity and volcanic eruptions, large or small. So if you see somebody talking about how they can predict earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, they are talking nonsense. Please post the link to this video when you hear this sort of thing. And until next time, goodbye.